Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be joining you once again for another episode, another author interview. This interview is another, like last episode, where I recorded the interview while I was still home in Montana, and now I'm recording this portion of the episode in California. So I've been home for almost a week, and it, I always call it re-entry after I come back from even just a small vacation, but this was a very long time, and so it seems weird to have to readjust to being home, but I I am. It's been great, though, so spending time with the husband, playing with the dogs, well, (sighs) trimming their toenails, doing the things that uh, they hate, and (laughs) so I'm sure that they're not happy that I'm back (laughs) But yeah, um, hanging out with the dragons, doing all that good stuff, and just readjusting to being in California again. It's cooler today and yesterday, so that's nice. It was in the 90s when I got back, but it's maybe potentially kind of starting to cool down. It usually cools down by about Halloween. I can wear socks and long sleeves. (laughs) So uh, These are the things that I look forward in life, socks and long sleeves. Yay. Okay, let's talk about books. Specifically, this week we are talking about White Skies, Black Mingo by Kevin D. Miller. Kevin is a returning guest to the podcast. If you want to check out his first episode, he was on back in March of 2020, March 7th of 2020, and that was episode 218. So you can check that out. We talked about his first historical fiction novel called Heart of Steel. That one was about his um, grandfather Stanley and um, a really really interesting series of events that happened in their family that they didn't find out about until after Stanley's death but today as I said we are talking about his second historical fiction novel that one is called White Skies Black Mingo and it is based in part on his ooh, great-great-grandparents marriage I think uh, interracial marriage in the 1870s which would have been um, controversial if not downright illegal it was probably illegal at that point um, his grandmother was a Native American and his father was his grandfather was Irish Irish I think just Irish maybe something else to run in there at any rate Caucasian so um, yeah he's got some he's got some interesting stories in his family tree I'm a little bit jealous of course I haven't done that much digging into my own family tree, so maybe if I did, I would find out more interesting stories. Or if I let my mom tell me about all the research she's done on ancestry, then I would probably know more. It's not that I don't let her tell me, but um, we haven't sat down to have a really in-depth conversation about it. Okay, let's talk about the book. Here is the description from the back of that book. Again, it's called White Skies, Black Mingo. In Ohio country, 1854, 12-year-old Margaret flees a terrible epidemic devastating her Ohio Seneca clan. Mentored in the ancient arts of medicine and healing at a young age, she travels to Wheeling, Virginia in search of a new life with her mother and shaman grandmother. When Margaret finds herself suddenly orphaned, she is thrust into the wilderness and an impending winter storm. Abandoned amid fur trappers, wild animals, and fierce winter weather, excuse me, yeah, fierce weather, she struggles to survive the treacherous journey along with her two beloved wolves, Hato and Keiki. An unexpected betrayal leads Margaret into servitude on a Virginia plantation. Her captivity changes the course of her life forever and sets her on a path of mercy as a medicine woman during the darkest hour of American history, the Civil War. 
A chance encounter with a Union soldier leaves Margaret torn between two very different worlds and one very forbidden love. Again, that is White Sky's Black Mingo. It is historical fiction. It is based on the author, Kevin D. Miller's great, great grandparents, I think he said, but he will, he will say how many greats in, in the interview. And yeah, so first off, it is a young woman, as it says, um, Margaret or Kateri, as is her Seneca name, is 12 when the story starts. She faces a lot of hardship in, especially initially in the book, but kind of throughout the book. And so she is this very determined, very strong, very independent young woman who is trying to now navigate white society and well, doing so during um, the Civil War and just trying to figure out life. And then she meets this Union soldier. He is obviously white and they have um, a strong connection, a strong attraction. And that is, of course, forbidden. So you get a little bit of everything. You get history with the Civil War. You get to learn a little bit more about the Seneca culture through the eyes of Kateri and her experiences as a um, a, a shaman um, or a healer in that culture, which actually um, was more of a male. Usually the males were healers, but her grandmother was a healer and it was passed on to her. So she, you know, she's already got different idea, different ideologies about male, female roles than she would encounter in the white world. But it's, it's a compelling story and it's a good love story. And Again, you've got the romance, you've got the historical fiction, you've got the drama of the Civil War, interracial relationship, etc. So let's go ahead now and turn to the interview with Kevin. Um, again, White Skies, Black Mingo, the author is Kevin D. Miller. Hi, Kevin. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. It's great to be back. This is kind of becoming a regular thing between us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stop meeting like this. Um, uh, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Actually, no, we have to continue meeting like this because it means you're running. Yeah. I've got more books. Yeah. So <laughs> I definitely want to keep meeting like this. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about uh, your new book, White Skies, Black Mingo. Before we yeah. get to that, though, um, if you could share a little bit about yourself, just to refresh people who may have heard the first interview sure. or, you know, to tell people who you are for people who haven't heard that interview. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um I, uh, my name is Kevin D. Miller. Um, I was born in Canton, Ohio, and I lived there the first six years of my life where uh, I moved with my family to Tempe, Arizona, where I grew up in the desert. Um, lived there most of my life. I spent eight years in the U.S. Air Force serving serving our great country as a, as a veteran. And then um, I am currently married and in uh, living in Burbank, California for the last eight years because I have two daughters who are have dreams of acting and are pursuing acting careers and doing doing quite well. Um, and then when they're finished with that, we'll probably move back to Arizona. But uh, I started writing as an author just, just in my later years. I never really thought I would become an author, but I found something that I just love. Um, and, I, and, I, and I found that in, our, in the first podcast that we have, I wrote a book called Heart of Steel, and it's based on a true story of my grandfather and how my name really isn't Miller, it's um, Puhalski. Uh, it is Miller because my grandfather changed it to that, but, but that's what got me writing. I mean, that's what got me into writing, and once I wrote that book and finished that, and, and I just fell in love with it, and I said, I got another story in my head. I got, you know, I'm going to research some more ancestors, and, and that's exactly what I did with White Skies, Black Mingo. It is a story based on the um, forbidden love of my great great grandparents. She was Native American, and he was the son of Irish immigrants. So, and I've got a third book I've completed that's not published yet. That's with my publisher, and I'm working on my fourth book right now. So, that's a little bit about me. Mm-hmm. All right. So you're just a little bit of an overachiever. It's fine. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> and you have very interesting um, ancestors. That's very, it's, which is cool. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's very cool. It's very interesting to um, to do the research on that. I spent a lot of time on 23andMe and Ancestry.com and, and just talking to relatives and such, just kind of getting as much information as I, I could gather. And it's fascinating what turns up, you know, sometimes shocking what turns up. So so be careful if you're out there researching your, your history. <laughs> I'll have to. Mm-hmm. 
My mom spends a lot of time on Ancestry, so I'll have to see if she's found yeah. any. Oh, there's always, always something in, in everybody's history. Yeah. So can you, you gave uh, sort of the elevator pitch for the book, but can you share sure. the premise of White Skies, Black Mango? Yeah, the, the premise of White Skies, Black Mango, as I said, it's inspired by, it's not based on a true story, it's historical fiction, but it's inspired by the forbidden love of my great-great-grandparents. And as I said, she was Native American, he was Irish. I am in a, I'm in a mixed relationship myself. My, my uh, wife is uh Hispanic. Um, she has a lot of Indian in her as well and stuff. So I could, so when I saw that, I'm like, you know what? 1800s, it's set in the civil war. I said, you know, what a great love story it's gotta be because it's forbidden love that, you know, uh, people were uh, a native American woman and a white man in 1860s w wouldn't be even be allowed to be married. But the story starts, it's a tale of a, of a young 12 year old a native American girl who who she, her mother, and her grandmother are fleeing an epidemic um, of smallpox in their uh, clan, in their tribe, and um, they're on the road. They, they've lost everything. They've lost their entire clan. They're on the road to uh, Wheeling, Virginia. You know, it wasn't West Virginia yet. It's pre-Civil War. Uh, looking for a new home. And on this road, on this journey, you know, she faces, she, she loses uh, quite a bit. She finds herself alone in the wilderness with her two uh, wolf companions. And um, it's a story of courage. It's a story of overcoming um, impossible odds uh, that, that, that are thrown at her, that she must survive. And she's, she's a young girl who doesn't know how strong she is until she actually has to be. You know, it's, it's, it's an inspirational story. Um, and she, you know, she faces a lot of things. She was mentored in the ancient arts of, uh, of uh, medicine by her grandmother, who was a shaman. And that's how she grows. And, and, and the adventure just continues on. She finds herself on a plantation at some point. And then another, then in another point, she'll have to make a choice. She'll, she'll find a, a forbidden love of a union soldier. And, and, and that's, and that'll take her on a, a different path to her life. So without giving uh, too much away, um, that's kind of sums up the premise of the story. Okay, so now that you know a little bit more about the prevalence of the story than my um, random babbling at the beginning of the <laughs> episode, we're going to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about his uh, David, geez, David, Kevin's grandparents and their relationship, how this story is based on that, all of that fun information. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Book Review Podcast. Today I am speaking with author Kevin D. Miller about his historical fiction novel, White Skies, Black Mingo. Let's return now to that interview. You said this is, um, you know, based on your great-great-grandparents. What what did you, was it just that relationship and the fact that it was interracial during that time, or was there something more specific that, that sparked your inspiration for the story? That that was the that was the main thing that initially sparked it. I thought that would make an interesting um, story, you know, a love story. But it's it's more than just a love story. There's there's a lot there, and it's and I wanted to tell the story um, from the perspective of a Native American, uh, you know, girl and then woman. Um, and I wanted to tell it true. I wanted to tell it true. I wanted to tell it honest. And and that was my goal is 
to so I did a lot of research into the Haudenosaunee uh, culture. It's more commonly known as Iroquois. You know, most people understand that term a little bit better, although the the Haudenosaunee really don't like that term too much. That was a term that the white man gave gave them. It's a French word, I think. But I wanted to make sure that I, I was true. That was the first goal was to make sure that I told this story that respect and honored our Native American brothers and sisters. And um, the second thing is I wanted to tell it, the story from a real standpoint through the eyes of a female protagonist. And as a male writer, that's often hard to do. And, and I feel that I successfully did, did that because I get a lot of feedback from uh, women. Actually, I got probably the best compliment I got was from the, um, the widow of uh, Bob Denver from Gilligan's Island, Dream of Denver. Uh -huh. She's also an she's also an author, and I got her to read the book prior to publishing to see if she'd write a blurb, and she just fell in love with it. She said it's the best because my favorite book of 2020. She said, she said if I didn't know that it was written by a man, I would swear it was written by a woman. She goes, that blew me away. I don't know how you did that. She goes, you must have a lot of strong women around you, um, and you listen to them, and and that's true. I have so many daughters, and I have so many women around in my life that that it really gives me an insight into that. And I, and I think um, with compliments like that, you know, even from my wife, she goes, yeah, yeah. You know, she, because my wife was a lot of help with a lot of things. I'm like, okay, from this perspective, what, what do you think she would think? So I, I leaned on her quite a bit, but even she says, she goes, you, you've got a good insight to, to how women think and stuff. So it helped in writing the book. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a great compliment. And also it, it's mm -hmm. that, um, you aren't ending up on some of those social media memes where women read right. really bad comments. Right, <laughs> right, right. That's what I did not want to do. That's yeah. exactly what I did not want to do. And anything that was questionable that I wasn't sure about, I, I consulted, you know, my wife, my daughters. Okay, what what would she think in this, you know, situation and stuff? Because I really wanted it to be realistic and true, and, 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 I, and I wanted – and with Dream is saying that, that that's like, okay, I feel like I accomplished my goal because I, I want the author, to, I mean, the reader to read that and, and not think, okay, a man's writing this, you know, to, you know, I definitely want my female readers to relate fully to, uh, to Maggie and the character. Her, her native name is Katiri, but uh, her English name is Margaret Davis. That's my great, great grandmother. And uh, they call her Maggie later on in the book. But that, and then, and then, just from a Native American standpoint, I, I, I see, seeked out a lot of Native American uh, readers to read it and and see, you know, I was kind of nervous at what their response would be. I, I actually had um, Dodie Rogers, who is the daughter of uh, Roy Rogers, back in you know the day he was actually Native American as well. People don't know that the old cowboy. You, you may be way too young to know who Roy Rogers is, but he was um, an actor and uh, singer uh, in the I think the fifties, yeah. but she's native. He, he adopted her and she's native American. And, and she said, yes, I'll read it. And she goes, and then she came back and she goes, I was curious how you were going to portray her, you know, being, you know, uh, a white man, even though I have native ancestry, I'm still a white guy. And, um, she says, you just did it beautifully. You know, you told it truthful you told it honest and you told it from the perspective of, of native Americans. And so she was, she is very complimentary. And and I like okay the second box I can check because that that really gave me confirmation that um, that I wrote it in, in such a way and it's won it's won nine major awards and, and and I think for that reason for its for its good you know truthful and honest um, and positive portrayal of Native Americans and and just the story in general so I'm real thrilled at the um, the awards that it's won. Yeah, congratulations on those. Um, that's wonderful. Thanks. So let's talk a little bit more about Maggie, and I think you've given a, a, a pretty good picture of her, but um, yeah. what else about Maggie do you think is going to resonate with readers? I think what's going to resonate with readers the most is is that they'll be able to relate to her. You know, she's a, she's a young girl, she's a young young lady, you know, trying to find herself, trying to find her way through the world, um, you know, not sure – um, that she has the courage or the ability to do the things that she's faced with, but she finds her courage. Uh, she finds her, uh, her spirit and her strength, and she overcomes these impossible odds. 
And I think it's also inspirational to the point that there's lessons in there about forgiveness, you know, and, 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 and seeing the world through other people's eyes, not just our own. So I think she's very relatable. Um, you know, again, going back to Dreamus, she says, I just completely fell in love with these characters, completely fell in love with Maggie. You know, you just can't help but um, root for her and just, you know, and feel her pain and her struggles and her, and her victories and, and such. So, um, so that, yeah, that's, I think they'll, though, I think she's very relatable and I think um, people are going to fall in love with her right away. I fell in love with her as soon as I started writing the story, you know, as it went along, you know, I just kind of say, you know, I just, really really um was very pleased with um the person she became and her character arc through the story yeah and then um aside from a good story a good read what do you hope mm -hmm. um readers might take away from the book i think I, what i hope they'll take away from the book is a is a maybe a, a new perspective on native americans a new perspective on um you know, people who are struggling, maybe people who are maybe facing their own, uh, you know, uh, odds, impossible odds, people may be facing their own problems and, and things that they just think they can't get through. And, and maybe the book will be in, inspirational for that. I, I have had some people contact me and, and tell me that, you know, the book made a big difference in their life because it inspired them. It gave them hope because the book um is written in a realistic way it's a, it's very believable you know and i think people are going to relate to it and i think what they're going to take away is that yeah you know life can get really tough you know but but through perseverance through love and forgiveness through strength through courage through you know um having your principles that you stand on and stuff you can push through those those obstacles. So I think it's going to inspire people. I think it's good that people are going to really enjoy the story and they're going to feel inspired by the story and how it turns out. Thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned a little bit of the research that you've done, but uh, I would imagine there was quite a lot of research that needed to be done for the book. Is there any particular aspect of that research that you would like to highlight? Oh, sure. Yeah, no, there was a lot of research I had to do. I mean, start obviously starting with the family, you know, I, I needed, I tried to find everything I could find out about Margaret Davis and Charles Flagg, my, um, my great, great grandparents. I found his, his actual regiment that he was in, in the civil war. He was a union soldier in the 63rd regiment of Pennsylvania. And I, and I was able to locate the dates of the battles that he fought in so that I could integrate those into the book. Everything I could find that was real history, I integrated into the book, you know, about her and about him. Um, and then, of course, I had to do a lot of research on the Civil War. I wanted to make sure I've got all the dates, all the names, all the facts correctly from a historical standpoint of the Civil War. And then I spent a lot of time investigating the Haudenosaunee's uh, culture, beliefs, traditions, their dress, their marriage traditions, you know, everything I could find on them as a people. And I'll tell you, they are an amazing people. And I learned uh, so much from, um, from my research. They, they're a very interesting um, culture. Um, I did a lot of research on plantations um, during that time. And of course, I had to research West Virginia and Virginia, you know, in the mid 1800s. Also did some research on Andersonville prison, you know, which was a horrendous um, Civil War prison where Union soldiers were kept. So that kind of took me down that road a little bit. But learning about the Haudenosaunee, I mean, it's a matriarchal society, and, and it's interesting because um, a male-dominated society was foreign to them because the, the women, you know, women and men were equal in that culture, and women probably wielded a little more power because they they were in charge of of electing the chief, you know. But if the chief didn't do what he's supposed to do, you know, the women would impeach him and replace him in, in, with someone who would. Um, a man married into the woman's family and lived in her clan. The children were part of the mother's clan, you know, so there was a, and the mother and the, the women were in charge of the land, you know, they owned the land, you know, so, um, so that was very interesting to me as well. So, um, it, so I learned quite a bit, you know, during that research and it just gave me just a, a wonderful insight and respect for Native American, American culture, which was just so advanced and in so many different ways. 
It is time for our second break of the podcast. As we go to that po- that break, though, I was just noticing again how Kevin and the book and I all refer to Margaret interchangeably as Margaret Maggie Kateri, <laughs> and she she you know so just just in case you you didn't catch that Margaret is her her Christian name, her uh, Kateri is her native name, and of course Maggie is a nickname of Margaret. You probably knew that. You're all very bright. But just in case you missed a segue somewhere along the way, Margaret, Maggie, Kateri, all the same person. When we come back, we'll be talking more about um, Margaret and that matriarchal society that Kevin was just talking about. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Kevin D. Miller about his novel White Skies Black Mingo. Before the break, he was talking about the main character's native heritage and the fact that it was a matriarchal society, what that meant for her in terms of integrating with white society at the time that she did. So let's go ahead now and return to the interview. Uh, Yeah, the matriarchal society explains a lot of uh, Maggie's Mm -hmm. mentality and why she bumps heads so much with with, uh, white society. (laughs) Right. No, exactly. Because she she wouldn't understand that. It's like we don't, you know, she is is foreign to her. You know, it's like the women, like in in the book, there's an exit, you know, talking about her grandmother and and her grandmother is a clan, you know, mother and and how strong the women are in in this in their society and how well respected they are. So it would be very foreign to her, you know, to then see European settlers and and the women be, you know, so submissive to their husbands because it's like, wait a minute, you know we're equal to the men, you know, the, in our society, you know, it's, it's, there's an equalness there. Everybody has their job and everybody has their roles, you know, but, but one doesn't dominate the other. So, so yeah. And it definitely created some really great stuff to work with, you know, from, um, from a character standpoint and a, and a story standpoint. Mm-hmm. Speaking of, of character standpoints, um, what types of character development do you like to do before you write? Um, and then how much do your characters surprise you as you write? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Initially, what I do with character development is I create a character profile for all the main characters, sometimes even some of the not main characters. And in that character profile, I'll, I'll figure out, you know, what their internal motivations are, their fears, their beliefs, their misbeliefs. Um, I'll, I'll figure out what their goals are, what their backstory is. And that way that helps me with develop their character arc from where they start in the book to where they end up at the end of the book, because, you know, they definitely have to have learned something through the story. So that's what I'll spend a lot of time doing that. So, I, so that I know the characters, because it's important, I think, to know the characters as, as much as you can. Even though you can't fully know them at the very beginning, you get to know them as as the story goes along and as you write as a writer as you're writing the story. Um, so yeah, no, she she gives me a lot of surprises, and it's it's just it's amazing. I think that's what I fell in love with with story writing is that sometimes I don't know where the story's going. Sometimes I don't know what the, you know is going to happen here or there, and it just it just comes. It starts to flow. It's like I'm inside the story 
writing what I'm seeing. You know, it's like, it's weird to explain that. I've, I've heard other authors say that they experience that. They have a name for it, but I can't think of what it is. I just call it the zone. You're just kind of in the zone living the story. And then all of a sudden it's like, yes, this makes sense for it to go this direction. You know, oh, that, that makes sense there. And then the characters kind of develop along, you know, as, as well. And, and yes, she surprised me quite a, quite a few times and stuff. So I had a lot of fun, you know, and, and a lot of enjoyment writing her story. Wonderful. I, I know that this is, you know, based on your great, great grandparents, um, but are there, <laughs> autobiographical elements in terms of, you know, things of your own experience or like, is there any of your daughters in Kateri or it, just anything like those, that? Oh yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, and, and absolutely there is because I draw off of what I know from the, the females, the women that are in my life. I, I pay attention to them. I listen to them. I, I know their strengths. I know their weaknesses. I know. Yeah. So, yes, there is a lot of my daughters in Kateri. You know, there's a little bit of my wife, I would say, in there. Um, you know, I have a I have a sister as well who's very close to. And I would say she's she's got a lot of characteristics from all, all of the women that have a, affected my life. Um, there's a little bit of each of them in there, um, you know, because she's I mean, she's a very strong character. She's a very strong woman. She, you know, at times she doesn't know, and it's, especially her youth, she doesn't know how strong she is until she has to be, and she rises to the occasion. And it, and all it's all, all the strengths and weaknesses that I see in, in the women in my life, I think I've drawn from to, you know, to inject, interject into her character. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we started recording, you mentioned that this is going to be an audiobook soon. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yes, I can't wait. It's so exciting. Uh, we have a wonderful um, voice artist um, working on the audiobook. Uh, she's moving along so quick. She's um, probably about ninety percent done with the recording, and then once that's finished, we'll, I'll send those those um, those MP3 files over to my publisher at Headline Books. And they will make it. Um, they'll make the audio book live on ACX and, uh, and Audible. And that uh, I anticipate that this audio book is going to be available sometime in October next month. So um, I, I know I have a lot of people waiting for because there's a lot of folks that don't necessarily read um, paperback because it's available in paperback and ebook for Kindle on Amazon and at the publisher site. Headline Books um, also sells it. And um, so, yeah, I'm excited to add the audio book to the mix there. And I've got a lot of readers or a lot of fans who say, I just I'm waiting for the audio book. So they're not going to be disappointed. The the audio, um, the voice artist is doing such an amazing job because it's sometimes it's hard to pull <clears throat> all the little intricate, you know, details of the story or, or to grasp the humor or to grasp the meanings of stuff. And she's done a wonderful job of capturing my humor um, capturing my intent, capturing the emotion that I intended and putting it on, you know, an audio for the story's just coming to life basically. And it's just, I'm just, sometimes I'm in tears and you know, it's like, I wrote the story, but I'm just moved to tears sometimes listening to the story because she just brings it to life. So I'm excited. Yeah. That it's going to be out, um, probably in November. That probably is not November, prob probably October. Okay, that's really exciting, and that is a yeah. compliment to the um, to the woman who's who's reading the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we talked last time about Heart of Steel, it was in the process of becoming um, a film. Is that still in the works? I know COVID kind of yes. threw thing, but yeah, it, those yeah these things seem to take forever here in Hollywood. Um, but it, it's been optioned by uh, GKG Productions here in Hollywood, and we're still pitching it. it, it with a time piece, you know, a, a time period piece, they, they're, the budgets are so high in those. They're very popular movies, but they're, the budgets are high. So it's hard. So we got to really be selective and try to find the right um, studio or investor, you know, that has the money to give it the, the budget that it needs, So which takes a little bit more time. We're also talking about, um, we're also in talks with somebody who might um, want to take this true crime story and make it a TV episode as well, which also helps bolster turning it into a movie. 
So that's in the works as well. So we're going to see about that. So lots of exciting stuff going on there. Yeah, that's a lot of details to keep track of. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you are working on your fourth novel. Can you talk a little bit about what that that one's about? Absolutely, yes. Um, and I'll even br brush over the third one. The third novel is called The Promise of Lazarus. Um, and it's I, I've sent that. Headline Books has, ex has accepted that they want to publish it. It's um. It's a little change from I've changed a little bit from the historical uh, drama and historical fiction over to um, you know a little bit of uh, science fiction. Um, not really science fiction, more speculative fiction. Yeah, and and that story, real quick, the synopsis there. That story is based on a um, neurosurgeon who is in her 30s. She has come up with a workable cryogenics. Uh, a method that actually works, um, puts people to sleep in a semi-frozen state until they can wake up and, and, you know, and maybe have a cure for whatever disease, fatal disease they have. And she's working this and her, the inciting incident occurs when she herself finds that she has an incurable form of brain cancer. So she has to make the decision to either stay and fight that cancer, which she doesn't have much of a chance, or enter herself into the very program that she created. And then 87 in the years, years into the future, she's going to see just what the implications of those, of that decision is, and, you know, the implications of maybe playing God would be. So it created a lot of interesting um, aspects to that story. So we're waiting on that one. Um, the, the story I'm currently writing right now, I'm about a third of the way through, it's called, um, the Cotton Mills uh, Orphan. And what I did is I wanted to go back to the historical fiction there. And I was moved because I watched an episode on, you know, the child labor back in the um, early, you know, turn of the century in the 1900s, where, you know, children were used in cotton mills. A lot of you know, the little ones were sent under these machines, these, um, where they were spinning cotton, you know, and it's a very dangerous job. You know, kids would lose limbs. They would have their hair pulled out. They would some even decapitated and killed in there. And, and, and it's just, they're used as child labor. They, they, they spend 16 hours a day, you know, in the mill being worked to death, basically. So I wanted to build a story around that. Um, so that's kind of what I'm working on, on now is, um, you know, the protagonist is a young boy who starts out at 10 years old in there and, and, and he um, kind of takes under his wing another young girl that comes in who um, is sent in that job as well. And, and, and their two paths kind of um, intermingle and um, as we go along there. But um, I'm still developing that story. I'm about a third of the way through it. But uh, so far, so good. So Let's go ahead and take our last break of the podcast. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Kevin D. Miller. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, any other writings that you would like to highlight? Um, th those are it. Those are what I'm working on as far as my writing and stuff goes. Um, the Promise of Lazarus, um, actually my publisher is, is pitching that book to um, a New York um, literary agent, which I'm, I'm waiting to hear back from. Um, because White Skies Black Mingo won for regional fiction in the uh, Next Generation Indie Book Awards, it's like 
probably the biggest um, book awards for indie books. Um, each of those winners gets their book read and reviewed by um, a lady named Marilyn Allen, who's a big New York um, literary agent, to see if they want to take the buy the rights to either make a movie or, or turn it into you know send you know you know convert it into other languages throughout the world you know. So and they can take you on, and it's a good way to get a, a to get a book agent, a literary agent, to represent you and pitch your books to the bigger publishers. But um, but my my publisher also pitched uh, the Promise of Lazarus to her as an unpublished work to see if you know she might be interested in that. So I'm real excited to wait to hear back you know from that. So but other than that, no, just the uh, the four books. I'm on the fourth book, and I've got other stories in my head, you know. And I, and as I do, I just write them down in my journal for later reference, you know, until I finish this one, I'll be off to the next one. Mm-hmm. All right. And then uh, in all of your spare time, because it sounds like you have so much, <laughs> do, you, uh, yeah. do you take time to read for yourself? What have you been reading? I do. I, I do. I'm, I'm not as uh, as good as an avid as reader as my wife is. She she cranks out books like every other day. I mean, I've got so many books of, of hers that she reads, but, but I do. Um, uh, recently, I've read... Um, um, three books by Michael Crichton, the the author of Jurassic Parks. I've I've wrote uh, I've read his book Timeline, Pirate Latitudes, uh, The Andromeda Strain, which he wrote like 50 years ago, and then I read uh, recently Dan Brown's Origin, um, and then uh, Blake Crouch wrote a book called Recursion. I read that, so that's that's what I've been reading lately. Yeah, I think you mentioned your wife's prolific reading habits last time too. And oh she, gosh, yeah, yeah, she outdoes me. She can read three books to my one, I think. Yeah, well, she sounds she's a lot got, like mom, so they should hang out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's got this habit of when she finishes the book, she throws it across the room. I, I don't know what that means exactly, but <laughs> she just like tosses it across the room to announce that she's finished it. I guess. That's so dramatic. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> you've mentioned that you know that you've heard from readers and that you you enjoy that so can you tell people where they can find oh, you yeah. on social media and yeah. i know you have a website absolutely yeah i love hearing from readers i get uh, emails all the time i just got one from a lady that lives uh, uh in uh, near warren ohio asking me about hard to steal the other day so that was interesting yeah you can find me the best way to find me and find all my uh, social media links is to go to my website and it's author kevinmiller.com so just author kevinmiller.com and on there i've got my link to twitter i'm on facebook i'm on youtube and my email's up there too so you know if you read my book and you have questions or just want to say hi um you know drop me an email i love i love hearing from readers um uh, and you know interacting so that's where you can find me all right. This is um, changing the subject from the internet, but you said Warren heard from a reader in Warren, Ohio, and was it you who had mm-hmm. the video a while back on Facebook where you were driving through Warren? Yeah, I did. I, I went I actually went um, two years ago, September. I took my dad um, and my brother back to that area because I wanted to find the farm, the actual farm where my grandfather. Um, lived on and where all of this took place in Heart of Steel. And we knew the kind of the location. So I had to go to the record, you know, Trumbull County records uh, and look up stuff there. I found the deed to the house. It didn't have an address, but it had a description. The Historical Society helped me find a plat map and I was able to match up the um, the deed with the plat number to the map. So I found it, but I didn't find that until after we came back, about three days after we came back. I was in the general area, but I found the exact location. So now I know exactly where it's at. And I'm gonna take another trip back to Ohio. So, cause I wanna walk the property. I wanna knock on somebody's door there and say, hey, here's a copy of my book. This happened here, and, you know, and in exchange, can I walk the property? Just, I just wanna feel, I just wanna, feel the energy of that maybe feel my grandfather's spirit there you know and, and just see and the property is like 97 acres the original property it's a huge uh, my great great uh, great grandfather my great grandfather was a rich farmer in the book and, and i didn't realize how much land he had there uh, at the time so so yeah it was a, a fascinating trip i went to the church where um the uh, funeral took place i went to the graveyard where my great grandfather is buried 
to find his grave and to and it's the place where you know one of the people were arrested in the book uh for the murder um so yeah it was it was fantastic and my my dad passed away last november so i was so happy that i that i got to take him on that trip because he was so thrilled you know when i wrote the story for him uh for my grandfather yeah i remember you saying that he he was really happy with the story yeah yeah definitely was I, I just remembered you posting that video because my my husband had just come back from Ohio and he has family. He'd just been to Warren also. So Oh, I, wow. Yeah, so that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. So yeah, my I, grandfather was born in Warren. So, yeah, that's so cool. Very cool. I had not gone mm-hmm. on that, so I, I got to see a little bit of where he was while he was there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was very interesting. Very, very interesting. We took pictures to railroads, you know, that went through there and mm-hmm. and just went around every, everywhere we could find, you know, that that's the areas in, that are in the book, you know, and I just took pictures and video. Yeah. But I'm definitely going to go back again because I want to find I'm going to walk the real farm because now that I know where it's at and um, and follow up and finish up on that and make, and make another, um, you know, video to document that. Right. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, Kevin, is there anything that we haven't talked about um, during this conversation that you would particularly like to highlight at this point? Um, I no, I think we've actually covered it pretty well, Sarah. I think we uh, went through it. Um, I really don't have anything else to add. Just to invite people to my website at authorkevinmiller.com dot com, and um, and and give me a chance as a, as a, as a new author. Um, you know, read my book, let me know what you think. And, and the best way to reward any author, as we know, is to write an honest review. You know, if if, um, if you uh, honor me by reading my book, you know, uh, I would ask you to please um, just give me an honest review as well on Amazon, Goodreads, wherever you, you know, might be inclined to write a review. Yeah, absolutely. That is one of the most important things people can do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for returning and talking about yeah. the new book and the upcoming books. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely, sir. I appreciate it, too. And, and yes, we'll make this a regular thing. And uh, I'll let you know when The Promise of Lazarus is published, and I'll I'll shoot a copy out there and, and hope that you read it and we can do this again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you once again to Kevin for joining me a second time on the podcast. Again, if you want to listen to his first episode, it is episode 218. It aired on March 7th of 2020. So you can go back and check that out if you haven't heard it already or if you want to listen to it again. If you are a fan of historical fiction, especially historical fiction set during the Civil War in part, if you are a fan of romance, sort of forbidden romance or you know uh, unconventional romance you might call it in this case Um, unconventional in that it was illegal (laughs) I guess that's unconventional Um, then this is a a great book for you you should check it out I mean because it covers a lot of bases historical fiction civil war romance native culture etc etc so um, definitely check this out and check out Heart of Steel as well if you have not already read that because that is a pretty amazing story as well and again based on Kevin's ancestors so very cool I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I was wishing my own family tree was a little more interesting And it occurred to me during the recording of this episode as I was editing and recording it um, that I learned something rather interesting about my own family while I was home this summer. My mom, as I said, has done a lot of research, but she found out when my, I think when one of my dad's sisters died several years ago, she found out that my grandmother's, my, my mother's excuse me, my father's mother, so his his maternal aunt, Clem, who I don't know much about. I don't remember her really. I have a vague memory of her. She made us all really cool quilts that I actually still have on my bed right now. She made us quilts, and I know one cute story about her when my sister was about a year old, and she was helping Auntie Clem wash the dishes, and she was helping by uh, just chattering away while Clem washed dishes, and um, 
she kept asking what sounded like a question and Clem didn't understand her. And so she just kept saying, yeah, yeah, uh uh-huh. And that gave my sister permission to continue scooping water out of the sink with a measuring cup and pouring it into the silverware drawer where it then dripped down through every other drawer (laughs) underneath it. But that's not the, that's, that's not the interesting fact that I found out. So Auntie Clem was married and divorced and married and divorced and married and divorced. I think it was three complete marriages and divorces, but all to the same person. So she married the same man and divorced the same man three times. And my mom knew that fact, but she did not know that it was an arranged marriage. They were part of a, a group um, the, it's Germans from Russia, and it's there, there's a whole history back there. So that uh, um, so pretty, pretty tight knit group in Western Montana, or possibly where were they living at that time? Eastern Montana. It doesn't matter. It was an arranged marriage. I had no idea that I had, was not that far generation wise removed from an arranged marriage. So you know, I should not stop. I should stop saying that there's no interesting tidbits in my family tree and I should maybe think more about that story see if I can find out any more information about it at any rate thank you to Kevin thank you as always to you my listeners if you have not done so already and you are so inclined please do me the favor of leaving a review for this podcast Um, it's either starred or written either way again as I always say helps us to get this podcast out to more listeners such as yourself Also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and I did it. We have TikTok. There's only one video on it right now, but there is TikTok, and that's GSNC Book Review as well. So if you want to follow on TikTok, you can. Be nice, (laughs) please. (laughs) Yeek! Anyway, join me next time when I will be speaking to author Stephanie Levine about her new cozy mystery. It's called... Headlines, Deadlines, and Lies. It is not a murder mystery. And that's kind of fun. It's a genealogy mystery. So it is actually the perfect, I just realized it's the perfect one to follow up what um, I was just speaking about with Kevin. That, you know, you never know what you're going to find when you start researching genealogy. So join me for that interview with Stephanie. That will be on Tuesday's podcast. In the meantime, I hope you have something great planned for your weekend but as always i hope that that weekend offers you plenty of time to sit back enjoy the fall colors get a beverage of your choice and get lost in a good book thanks you've been listening to the golden state media concepts book review podcast part of the golden state media concepts podcast network you can find this show and others like it at www gsmcpodcast.com Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.